In today's lecture, we're going to talk about evolution. Now, this picture is of Charles Darwin, who is going to be the father of evolution. He's going to publish his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection in 1859. And in this book, he's going to kind of talk about three broad observations that he has observed in his studies. The first is that there's a rich diversity of life. And so if we go outside, you can see that there are you know, dozens of different types of flowers just in a single little area, lots of different types of birds, insects, and things like that. We don't just have one type of bird in the entire world or one type of flower. We have thousands of different types, and that is going to kind of result in this rich diversity. He also notices that there are going to be similarities between different groups of organisms that can allow them to be classified together. And so for example, you can look at butterflies. And so you'll have some butterflies that we would classify as being kind of in the same group, but then we could have other groups of butterflies that while they're not exactly the same, they're still a butterfly. And so we can classify that broader group. We can then maybe classify butterflies and moths because they have similar characteristics. So this is the idea that we can classify these different groups based on these similarities and ultimately show kind of that these have all come about through a common ancestor. The last main observation that emer emerged was that organisms are extremely well suited for their environment. If you look out and go to the desert, you see all these different types of adaptations that both the plants and the animals have that allow them to thrive in a very difficult environment. And so we look at the animals and the plants and we can see how they have adapted to their environment to deal with things like water and things with like sunlight. This is going to be another really important observation that's going to help lead to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Now Charles Darwin, when he was approximately 20 years old, he is going to go on a voyage and kind of go around the world. So he is on the voyage of the Beagle, and the Beagle is the name of the ship, it's the HMS Beagle, and he travels around the world, and in this image you can see the red lines represent where he traveled. He went all over from South America, Africa, Australia, New Zealand. And in his travels, he was able to kind of explore the natural world, collect thousands of different specimens, and start to really look at the diversity of life. Now, one of the places that he studied in great detail were the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos Islands are these islands that are off the coast of Ecuador. They are called an archipelago. Archipelago, archipelago, which means that there are multiple different islands all in the same area, but they're not necessarily connected. And so what he did when he was looking at the Galapagos, he saw all the different types of flora and fauna. And one thing he did is he compared those flora and fauna to what you found on the mainland of Ecuador, because Ecuador is um, kind of the closest landmass to this. He found lots of interesting and unusual fossils, and he found that the plants and animals that were on the continent had unique characteristics very distinct from those that he has seen in Europe. Okay, so he, Charles Darwin is from England, and the flora and fauna are going to be completely different from what he sees at home. He found these species that you can't find anywhere else in the world. And he also found that on the islands of the Galapagos, each island had unique species to itself. Okay, so you can have different types of birds on the different islands. While they could be sort of similar, they are distinct different groups. And what he found is that the species that were on the islands also were similar to the ones that you found on the mainland of Ecuador, but they weren't quite the same. And so there's been some change that's happened. So here are a couple good examples of some of the interesting groups of animals that were found on the Galapagos. 
We have the Galapagos tortoise. These are the biggest tortoises in the world. There are lots of different species of these on the different islands. We have in the right upper corner, this is a Galapagos cormorant. It is a non-flighted bird, so it has lost the ability to fly, but it can actually swim underwater and catch different fish and things like that. Below it, we have the blue-footed booby with their bright blue feet that play a really important role in their courtship. I think these two birds right now in the, in the picture are actually doing a courtship dance um, that's really important in kind of how they do their mating. And then we have the marine iguana. This is the only iguana in the world that is marine and that means like aquatic. It lives on the land and then goes into the water and actually eats seaweed um, for its food. So very interesting and distinct animals found on the globe. On here we have just a timeline of some important events. There were very important discoveries that happened that were really important and influential to Darwin. Um, specifically Lyle, which we'll talk about, he is going to publish the principles of geology. Um, but the rest of this timeline kind of shows you some important events that are going to happen in Darwin's life. Now it's important to know what was actually going on during the time where Darwin was doing his work because the ideas about life, about diversity, about the age of the earth were very different from what um, they are today. And much of this kind of leads to controversy when Darwin actually releases his theory of evolution, but it's important to know kind of what what were the cultural and scientific prevailing ideas of the day? So this origin of species will ultimately challenge some important views. And so at this time, it was thought that the earth is relatively young and we're talking on the order of a couple thousand years, I think probably around 7,000 years. So that is, seems like a very long period of time, but when we think about the age of the earth, it is, a tiny amount of time. So the origin of species is going to challenge this idea that the earth is young. And um, on here you can see an image of kind of Adam and Eve and this I, kind of timeline of how old the earth is biblical in the kind of the idea of the biblical um, age. The other idea was that the earth is populated by unrelated species. So kind of this idea of Noah's Ark where you have kind of of lots of different types of organisms, but they're all unrelated to each other. So a horse is not related to a cow, is not related to a lion. And that's going to start to change because ultimately what Darwin is going to propose is that there is a common ancestor between all living organisms. Now, one of the reasons why people thought that organisms were unrelated was because of this idea that was promoted in ancient times by Aristotle. And this is the idea of a fixed species. So the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he believed that all the species on the planet, so this is gonna be every single bird, fish, plants, all of them are fixed. They do not evolve, which means that they do not change. Okay, so you should not see any change in these, these groups over time. They should stay exactly the way that they are. Then um, when we have kind of the Judeo-Christian point of view, they are going to back up this idea that Aristotle had, because if you take a literal interpretation of the Bible, it suggests that the earth may only be around 6,000 years old. And so these two things together kind of were two of the major ideas that prevailed into the time of Darwin. But what I want to mention is that there have been other individuals in time that have talked about things like evolution. They often were kind of bizarre and incorrect, but the idea of organisms being fixed has, fixed has not always been what everyone kind of believed. So I always like to tell about this man, his name is Enix Mander, and he lived 610 to 546 BC, and he wrote about the, the animal origins, okay? And so he saw that there were fossils, um, 
And what he prom he kind of thought of was that animals sprang out of the t sea a long time ago. And when he was discussing this idea, he would say that out of the sea emerged these animals that were fish-like. Um, and after time, these animals, men took form and embryos were held prisoners until puberty. And then they burst through and men and women came out now able to feed themselves. So we know that this is kind of crazy right now. Um, this is hard to believe. But this idea that things change over time and also the idea of life emerging out of the water, that's spot on because we're going to find that life is going to evolve in the water and then is going to kind of emerge from that. Um, but again, the overall picture of his ideas were, were incorrect, but this idea of things do change. So I, we like to call him um, evolution's most ancient proponent. So there started to be more individuals that were thinking about this idea of organisms or species not being fixed and that there could be changes over time. Now, one of the main lines of evidence for this is fossils. And so fossils became a very important area of science in the mid 1700s. So people were finding fossils and trying to classify them and see, you know, what are these and what do they represent? So different scientists would compare the fossil forms that they found to things that were living. And sometimes you could find things that were very different and you can't really see them living anymore. But other times you can see that there are living organisms that are very similar to the fossils that they find. Now, one naturalist named George Buffon, he found that the Earth may be more than 6,000 years old and kind of the ideas of fossilization and these processes leading that, you know, maybe the Earth has to be older for this to take place. He also found that there are similar similarities between fossils and living species. So things that have died, you know, thousands of years ago appear to be similar to living species, not always the same, but slightly um, kind of similar. So fossil forms might be ancient versions of similar living species. And so for example, we have a picture of a giraffe. And so if you look in the fossil record, you can find organisms that look like giraffes, but maybe aren't completely the modern type of giraffe that we have today. In the earth, early 1800s, another naturalist named Jean-Baptiste Lamarck suggested that life does evolve. And he's kind of credited with this first theory of evolution, ultimately is going to be proven wrong. Um, but it is kind of starting to think about this idea that life evolves. So Lamarck said that evolution is kind of a refinement of traits that help organisms perform successfully in their environments. And he said that if organisms use specific body parts or don't use specific body parts, that will then kind of be passed on to the next generation. Now, this is not how evolution takes place. Um, and we will discuss the actual mechanisms. Um, but this again is just kind of this early thought of life evolves. The mechanism is incorrect, but you know, we're kind of taking these steps as we go. So Charles Lyell is going to be a really important um, character in the story of Darwin and his uh, theory of evolution. So while Darwin is on his voyage, he comes across the, the work of um, Charles Lyell and he, this book is entitled Principles of Geology. And in this book, Charles Lyell presents this idea of a very old Earth. So we're talking millions of years now, not you know, 6,000 years. And this idea that the Earth looks the way it does today because of these gradual geological processes that happen. And these geological processes are happening today. Okay, and so when we think about earthquakes, we think about mountain ranges getting taller. Um, these are the kind of things that Lyle is going to say require a lot of time. 
So Darwin then applies Lyell's principle of gradualism or this gradual change over time to the evolution of life on Earth. And one of the things he kind of can see both the geological side and the biological side is um, the growth of mountains are going to be the result of earthquakes. And so when we have two land masses coming together and they start pushing towards each other, we can start to have the growth of mountain ranges. One of the things that he found, Darwin found when he was on his voyage, is he went to the top of the Andes Mountains and found marine snail fossils up there. So these are marine snail fossils or things that you find in the ocean. And the only explanation of why those would be there was that that mountain range was underwater at one point. Um, and it's only after millions of years and kind of lots of geological processes do you find those marine snail fossils on the top of a mountain. So after Darwin comes back from his voyages, he is going to look at kind of all of the things he's collected. He reflects on his observation. He analyzes his specimen collections and he discusses his work with other people. But he ha starts to have some serious questions about things that he's believed. The first is the age of the earth. And so the prevailing idea at this time again is that the earth is very young, about 6,000 years old. But people like Lyle are saying that that's untrue and the earth is actually much older. So, you know, is the earth a couple thousand years old or millions of years old? Darwin starts to communicate with other scientists that are find having other findings um, similar to his. And Darwin starts to kind of formulate his ideas, but he decides not to publish any of his work because he's worried about the public outcry if he does pursue this. Um, again, the things he's finding seem to contradict, you know, the biblical idea of, time, of the age of the earth and things like that. And so he's very worried about what would happen if he releases his work. But unfortunately, he has, he's going to push, actually, maybe not unfortunately, but fortunately, he's pushed to publish idea, his ideas. And it all happens because of another scientist. And so in the mid-1850s, another scientist named Alfred Wallace, who is a, another British naturalist, he does a lot of field work in Indonesia. And he sends Darwin, who, you know, Darwin's much older at this point, um, his findings and Wallace's findings are almost identical to Darwin's concept of natural selection. And this basically lights a fire under Darwin's butt because he knows that if he doesn't publish his work now, Wallace will publish his and then he'll not get the credit for it because egos usually do matter in science. So here's Alfred Wallace and he did lots of studies um, of butterflies and really interesting flora and fauna of Indonesia. So when Darwin then writes back to Wallace, he says, all my originally, originality will be smashed. And so he's afraid of being scooped by Wallace. And so Darwin and Wallace, Wallace basically publish their work together. Darwin is going to be the main figure of the theory of evolution. Um, Wallace is also very important, and Wallace is a huge proponent of Darwin, and it seems like there was not kind of a bad relationship between the two of them, more of a collegial, and both promoting this, this idea of evolution. And so, again, in 1859, The Origin of Species is published, and it's not just a theory where Darwin says this is what's happening. He presents so much evidence and strong logical argument for evolution. Okay, and so um, that's why, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution is still something that we talk about today. We still study it. We still find more evidence for it. And that's why we talk about it in this class. So now we're going to talk more about kind of the actual nitty gritty details of the theory of, of evolution. Okay, and so this is a hypothesis. It has, you know, a scientific explanation and he has observations. So we're kind of going through the process of science. Okay, you can't just say something and then not test it. So everything that Darwin proposes, 
is testable and falsifiable um, and therefore, you know, kind of a legitimate theory. So he has hundreds of pages of evidence that kind of promote his idea of the theory of evolution. There's testable predictions and he, he performed experiments and people continue today to do experiments to kind of help understand evolution. And his main kind of idea that comes out of the theory of evolution is that present day species are descendants of ancient ancestors that they resemble in some way. And so in this, this image, what you see is kind of ancient species of, or ancient ancestors of elephants um, today, we only have the two types left, the Asian elephant, and African elephant, but if you look in the fossil record, you can actually see these other ancestral types. And you can see that the modern elephants resemble those ancient ancestors. Now, the way that this happens is that over a period of time, and this usually takes you know, a significant period of time, but there are differences that start to accumulate and this process is called descent with modification. Descent with modification is a very important concept. Um, and it's just this idea that, you know, the descent would be, you know, your descendants are the, the people that come after you or your, your offspring. They can have slight modifications in them that will accumulate over time. And so kind of through the generations, you can have change in species. Life evolves and the process, the main process is going to be called natural selection. So we'll kind of talk about what natural selection is. Now, there are two main concepts that Darwin um, kind of promotes. The first is this idea that life evolves. Okay. And the second is that the change occurs because of descent with modification. And this is with natural selection as the mechanism. Now, in this image, we have a very kind of, um, popular example of evolution and natural selection. And so what we have are these two pepper moths and one of the pepper moths is black and the other one is white with some black speckles. And the idea is that we're going to start talking about if you're a predator and you're coming in and you want to grab one of these moths, which one's going to be easier to see? And so hopefully all of you can see the white one a little bit better. And so it's going to be much more easy for a predator to catch the white one than the black one. And so this idea that there is going to be kind of certain individuals in a, in a group of organisms that have some type of characteristic that's going to make them survive better than others. And so in this case, having black coloration makes this moth blend in and is much more difficult to see. Okay, and so if that then moth survives and has more offspring that then look like the, the black, then this will be this idea of kind of descent with modification. Okay, so natural selection is a process in which organisms with certain inherited characteristics are more likely to survive and reproduce than our individuals with other characteristics. So in our example with the pepper moths, the black moths are going to be, have certain characteristics being black that allow it to survive and reproduce more than an individual with a different characteristic being white. Okay. So in this situation, the black moth would do much better and reproduce more and have more offspring. Now there are two main points in the origin of species. So all of the organisms inhabiting the earth are going to descend from ancestral species. And at one point we'll talk about how there is kind of this last common universal ancestor um, that all of organisms on the planet can trace their kind of ancestry back to. And, you know, as the different descendants of these very early organisms kind of spread into various areas of the world, they're going to modify and adapt to the environments that they find themselves in. So if we have kind of different organisms moving into a desert ecosystem or a jungle, a rainforest, organisms are going to need to adapt to be able to survive in those different types of locations. Okay, so there has to be this mechanism of change 
over time. And natural selection is going to be kind of this process that's going to allow for adaptations to take place. Okay, and so natural selection was the mechanism for the descent with modification. So when we're looking at natural selection, we're going to start talking about something that we term fitness. And fitness is not going to be, you know, how much you weight lift and how often you exercise and things like that. It actually has to do with your genetic contribution to future generations, which is, means how many times are you going to pass on your genes to the next generation? So when we think about fitness in an evolutionary sense, we're thinking about how many offspring do you have? Okay. Now, we're going to have individuals that are going to vary in their fitness. So not all individuals are going to be adapted to their environment as well as others. And this is going to then kind of be important when it comes to how they will actually survive. Okay, so adaptations of organisms within a population to their environment. And so when we have adaptation taking place, we call these adaptive traits, where it's a heritable trait that is going to enhance an individual's fitness to an environment. Okay, so again, your fitness is how many offspring you can have. If you are really well adapted to your environment, you're going to be able to survive, you're going to be able to thrive and have a lot of offspring. But not all organisms are going to have that same kind of ability. Now, when we talk about natural selection, we can say it's defined as differential success in survival and reproduction, which means that not all organisms are going to survive and reproduce at the same level. Okay, so there are going to be some that do really well, there are going to be some that do horribly, um, and you're going to find them all across the spectrum. It's going to be those ones that survive and reproduce at high levels that are going to start to change the population. Now here is the example of kind of adaptation to environments. So I hope everyone can see the different uh, insects that we have here and a lizard. So if you can see, there is a praying mantis um, in this upper picture. It looks almost identical to the orchid that it's sitting on. We have some, another praying mantis, and then I think this is a katydid. Um, and then we have a gecko right here. All of these show the extreme kind of nature that can happen with certain adaptations where these organisms over long periods of time have adapted to basically camouflage themselves so you can't even see them in some cases. And so you might say, well, how does this even happen? Well, over a period of time, if you have these slight mutations, and we'll start talking about mutations again, but if something makes this gecko or lizard look slightly more brown, then those ones will probably hide better than one that was green. And then maybe they have this pattern that um, evolves and that makes them even harder to be seen. And so those individuals that have these traits that are beneficial will survive and reproduce at really high rates. And therefore, kind of, they will be the most prominent group in the next generations, surviving and reproducing at higher rates. Now, here is a table of the principles of natural selection, and um, you can look at these kind of looking through about populations, genetics, and then some inferences. Uh, we'll go over a lot of this information, but I just wanted to put a table so that you can kind of refer back to this um, over time. So now we're going to talk about the evidence for evolution. So biological evolution will leave a lot of observable signs that we can then use to kind of back up this theory. There are gonna be four main lines of evidence that we're gonna talk about right now. The fossil record, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, and molecular biology. So the first are going to be kind of fossils. Um, so mo most fossils that we find are gonna be mineralized bones, um, skulls, or teeth. And so here we have different examples of, um, we have a bone for the dinosaur bone. Uh, this is actually a baby woolly mammoth, um, basically intact. Uh, we have an insect um, that's kind of embedded with an amber. And then we have this is called a trace fossil. Um, and so um, we can sometimes have what we call cast or mold fossils, which are created when there's an organism that's kind of buried um, and then decay and then covered. 
And so if there's an empty hole where an organism was filled and that kind of fills in with the sediments or um, the minerals. Um, so trace fossils are actually going to be where footprints were. Um, so these look like dinosaur footprints. Uh, they were covered almost immediately after the dinosaur walked over it, and it kind of leaves that spot. And so you can actually look at the both, you know, how the feet look like and also the gait. So how far away are foots and our footsteps. Okay, so fossils are imprints or remains of organisms that have lived in the past. Um, they're often going to be found in sedimentary rock. So fossils are rare. They have to be um, kind of if an organism dies, it has to be buried pretty quickly after um, the death for it to create a fossil. And so many situations when things die, they would never create a fossil. Um, but sedimentary rock, kind of the nature of it, allows for fossilization to happen. Kind of sedimentary rock is these layers upon layers of different um, sediment. Now the fossil record is kind of the ordered sequence of fossils as they appear in rock levels, layers. And the deeper you go, the older the fossil is. So if we have something that's kind of near the surface um, of the ground, that would be kind of a relatively young fossil. But the deeper and deeper you go down into the ground, you're going to get older layers of rock, which means that those fossils were created much earlier. So what the fossil record allows for, because it's kind of set in stone, is that it reveals kind of the organisms in a historical sequence. And so you can look at the different layers and see, well, when did this organism live? Did it go extinct? If it goes extinct, then we can't see it in any younger layers of um, sediment. The oldest fossils that have been found are about 3.5 billion years old, and they all are prokaryotes. Okay, so um, these would be unicellular organisms, very, very old, um, but these are going to be kind of the very first ones that we find. All right, when we look at both molecular and cellular evidence, the prokaryotes should be kind of the ancestors of all life which then makes sense for them to be the oldest fossils. Okay, we would, it'd be very confusing. It would not make sense if we found, you know, eukaryotes that were older than prokaryotes because prokaryotes are what we think of are the common ancestors of all of us. Now, when you go into the fossil record, you can sometimes see transitional forms. And so, for example, um, in this image, we can see kind of a transitional form from a terrestrial or organism. So it kind of looks like a, the feet look like deer, but it kind of looks like a big rat um, or wolf or some sort. But in the fossil record, you can see the transitional steps um, that we can go to then having some type of whale-like organism. So um, when we have marine animal or marine mammals like whales, dolphins, um, sea lions and things like that, all of those are going to be descendants of terrestrial organisms. And so in the fossil record, you can actually see that, um, see those transitional forms where you can have some groups that, you know, have, are really losing their limbs um, and some that are, you know, basically have only flippers um, in this stage. Over here we can see kind of this organism, it kind of looks like a dolphin, that has a limb bone for a leg. And we know that modern day dolphins do not have legs, but we think that they evolved from uh, terrestrial organisms which would have had all four limbs. Um, paleontologists are going to be the scientists that actually study fossils. So that would be the technical term for an uh, individual that studies fossils. And many have discovered these transitional forms that link kind of the present forms to the ancestral forms that we find in the fossil record, which again kind of shows this historical perspective of how things have changed over time. We don't look in the fossil record and see all of the organisms we see today in the exact same form. Usually they're going to be slightly different um, and sometimes very different from what we see today. The next major line of evidence is comparative anatomy. And comparative would be meaning you compare two different things or three different things. Anatomy has to do with structures on the body. And so for example, in this image, we have um, 
the limb bones of some different organisms. So these are going to be, you have a box turtle, a dolphin, a human, and a horse, a bird, and a bat. And these are all going to be kind of the limb bones of these organisms. And so we can then compare the organisms, you know, what bones are present, how are they modified, how are they similar, how are they different, okay? And what this allows us to do is that we can see that evolution is a remodeling process. So one of the things I'm going to try to get you guys to understand is that history matters when it comes to evolution. Things don't just evolve out of nowhere um, from, you know, if you don't have a wing to start with, you can't go from no limbs to straight to a wing. That just is not how things happen. You can go through stages where, you know, limbs were present and then maybe they um, had some modifications that made them a little bit better for catching air and then ultimately to the point where they're able to promote flight. But history matters. There's remodeling. So things have to kind of, it's important to understand the history of different structures. Now we have this term homology and homo means same. So when you think of homology, it's similarity in structures due to the same kind of ancestry, so common ancestry. So if we look at the turtle, dolphin, human, horse, bird, and bat, all of them have these five bones. They have a humerus, a radius, an ulna, a carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. I think that's more than five. But they have all of those, and they've just been remodeled. So that shows that there's a common ancestor that all of these different groups kind of came out of. Okay, so homology, similarity, and structures due to common ancestry. So the arm of a human is going to be homologous to the front limb of a turtle, the fin of a dolphin, the wing of a bat, the wing of a bird. Okay, so there are homologous bone structures. Okay, so this is showing, again, these remodeling of the pattern of bones in these different um, groups. Okay. Not all of these are mammals. Um, some of them are mammals, but the turtle and the chicken are not. When we look at kind of understanding this comparative anatomy and these modifications and remodeling processes, uh, we can see that there are sometimes constraints to how things can be modified, and it leads to anatomical imperfections. And one of these can be seen in humans pretty easily. So the humans, humans evolved from quadrupedal organisms, which means that they walked on four limbs. So, you know, your hands would be walking on the ground as well as your feet. But we have then evolved the ability to write, be, be bipedal, where we have just walking on two limbs. But what happens is our skeleton, because we evolved from um, quadrupedal organisms, our skeleton is adapted initially for that. And so everything's been modified post kind of that quadrupedal stance, which means that our hips, our spine, our knees are not perfectly adapted to walking bipedally. So human, the human spine and knee joints are problematic. They are going to cause problems for most humans at some point in their life. They are subject to sprains, strains, spasms and other common injuries because if we were to design a robot with you know perfect way for the bones to be stable and very strong and the spine to hold our body it would not be what has evolved but the reason why we are stuck with what we are stuck with because that's the historical constraints of evolution okay so we can't just evolve a new knee out of nowhere history matters and we have to just be able to remodel something. We can't just form something new. When we talk about comparative anatomy, we also can sometimes call, talk about these things called vestigial organs or structures. And what these are, are going to be kind of remnants of features that in ancestral forms were present, but are now have been lost. But sometimes there's something that goes a little bit wrong in development and those vestigial structures that are no longer present will actually show up again um, 
in an organism. So here's an example of a snake. So snakes don't have any limbs generally, but we know that they evolved from organisms that did have four limbs. And so in fossil records, you can actually see um, a snake, but that has little limb bones um, that haven't quite been lost yet. Um, in modern day snakes, sometimes you'll have little limb buds that come out. They're usually not supposed to be there, but sometimes again, development doesn't go perfectly correct and they show up um, on an organism. Okay, and so this would be an example of vestigial organ. An example of this in humans is that uh, if we go back far enough in our ancestry, we had ancestors that had tails and occasionally humans are born with tails. Um, obviously most of us don't have them and if you do have one, you usually get it taken off, uh, but that is a vestigial organ. We no longer require a tail. Uh, it's not important to our survival and so it's been lost, but it's still there present in the DNA. It's usually been turned off, um, but it sometimes can be turned on um, if there's been some type of issue. Comparative embryology is similar to comparative anatomy, but we're looking specifically at the embryos of different organisms. So in this image, what you can see are kind of different groups. We have fish, salamander, turtle, I think this is a, we're a bird of some sort. I can't read that. Um, pig, different groups. I can't read all of them that well. And then a human. The main thing to look at this image is that these all look very similar. Early in the embryo, in the embryo form, the very first stage, these are the ones at the top of the image. It's very hard to distinguish any of these from each other and they look very similar to each other. And so what we say is that um, embryology kind of re recapitulates um, evolution and so it shows that there, we are very similar to each other and other organisms that are related to us in this early um, part of our development. And then later on, as things have changed, gene regulation has changed patterns, you then start to get these different types of organisms um, that we can see here. So early stages of development reveal these homologous relationships so that we're coming from a common ancestor. Some of the examples of this in vertebrates are that all vertebrates have pharyngeal pouches. Okay, um, the pharyngeal pouches are take, they're going to turn into gills for like fish and some other organisms. In us, they ultimately turn into um, kind of ear bones and throat bones, but they start off with the same structure in a fish and a human. It's then that we just kind of take these different trajectories um, because of different evolutionary steps that have taken. When we look at comparative embryology, it supports the theory of evolution, again, because we're showing these common ancestry. If every organism was unrelated to each other, there would be no reason why everything would look so similar in embryo embryological development. It just wouldn't really make that much sense. And so the best explanation is that there are similarities because of a shared ancestry. Here's just a picture of a chicken embryo and a human embryo. Um, so yes, they look a little bit different, but there are some similarities. So we have the pharyngeal pouches and the postanal tail. Okay, um, the tail, like I said, we usually lose it. It sometimes does show up in uh, humans um, when they're born, but uh, most of it's gonna be lost. The last major line of evidence is molecular bio, our molecular biology or kind of the DNA itself. If we look at every single organism on the planet, all of it has the same genetic code. We make the same D, we have the same bases, we make the same amino acids, proteins are encoded by the DNA. And so we show this kind of evolutionary relationship between um, the different species. And when we look at kind of comparing closely related species and then very distantly related species, we can actually look at the amino acid um, and the base, the bases to compare them and say like, which ones are the same, which ones are different. And so in this image down here, you have different groups, different animals, and, and not all of them are animals actually, there's a baker's yeast, but 
you have um, kind of the amino acid that is coded for, and you can see in the red which ones have some changes, but there's a lot of similarity from a honey creeper, song sparrow, island finch, deer mouse, black bear, a fish, a human, a, bab a baboon louse, baker's yeast. There are similarities, which is showing this shared common ancestry. Obviously, things that are more closely related will have a more similar uh, kind of genetic code. And so if you see the first three, honey creeper, song sparrow, and the island finch, all those are birds. And so they're going to be really closely related to each other because they're all in the same group. Now, Darwin, um, he is going to kind of promote this, you know, this really kind of bold hypothesis that all forms of life are related. And this is this is controversial. Uh, this is an actual image from his writings, and this is, you know, could be one of what we call one of the first uh, trees of life, where it's showing that kind of how organisms have evolved with each other and how they're connected. And if you see this point where it says number one, that's kind of like the common ancestor, and from there we have these different branches of life that lead to different groups of organisms on the planet. And so 100 years after Darwin kind of made this claim, um, molecular biology has provided strong evidence for evolution. Okay, so all forms of life use the same genetic language of DNA and RNA. The genetic code, so how the RNA triplets are translated into amino acids is nearly universal. And the genetic language of how we kind of is passed along through all the branches. So if we look at a bacteria versus a human versus a bird versus a fish, they're going to all share these same characteristics. And the only explanation is that they are related to each other and come from a common ancestor. So here is a, just another example kind of of that. Um, there's lots of misconceptions about evolution. Um, and many people said that Darwin was basically saying that we have evolved from chimpanzees, which is an incorrect statement. So humans are related to chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, and old world monkeys, but we do not evolve from either any of those groups. What we do is we share a common ancestor. And so if you go far enough back, there is a, a, an ancestor that then was able to split off into these different groups and create these, other, these different groups of organisms. Okay, and so we have our closest relative, the chimpanzee, we share about 96, 98% of the DNA with them, um, but they are not our ancestors, okay? And they're still alive, so that also shows that they're not our ancestors. All right, so one of the big ideas that Darwin um, talked about in The Origin of Species was how animals were very adapt, animals and plants were adapted to their environment. And one of the best examples of this that he found were the Darwin's finches. And so in lab this week, we talk all about Darwin's finches um, and experiments about how, you know, um, what kind of mimicking what took place with Darwin's finches. But this is gonna be kind of very important. And it has to do with the Galapagos Islands, which were one of the most important places that Darwin went to. So here are some pictures of Darwin's finches. Um, there are many different species, and the main thing to notice is the size of the beaks. You have big beaks, little beaks. Um, we also have beaks that use tools, um, but the beak is going to be the main focus of kind of Darwin's studies. What he noticed was that the beaks are adapted to feed on specific types of food. And so if you have a really big beak, you're able to eat very large nuts, very hard nuts. But little beaks were really good at little tiny seeds. And so the beak is adapted for specific food types. And thus, the organisms are adapted to their environment. Okay. Now, Darwin is going to base his theory of natural selection on two major observations that he sees. And one of these observations is that all species tend to produce excessive numbers of offspring. So if you look for most organisms, you know, the other day I was taking a hike and I saw a pond full of um, tadpoles and there were hundreds of tadpoles. 
And unfortunately, most of those tadpoles are not going to survive to become adults. Okay, so there's excessive numbers of offspring and the organisms are going to vary. Some of them are going to be able to um, survive better than others. And that variation in survivability is going to be heritable. So it's passed on from, you know, in their genes. And so we're going to talk about these two major key findings. Okay, so ops Observation number one is that there's an overproduction. So all species tend to produce excessive numbers of offspring, okay? What this does is it then leads to a struggle for existence, okay? So you can kind of start to think of survival of the fittest. So which ones are going to be survived, which ones will not? There's always gonna be competition. It's gonna be competition within a species, sisters against sisters and sisters against brothers and brothers against brothers. All of the offspring are going to have to compete for the same resources. In this image, we have um, kind of the sea slug that is going to have uh, a bunch, you know, hundreds of eggs, thousands of eggs. Only a very small percentage will actually survive. Okay, and so those ones that survive are going to have some type of um, heritable traits that are going to make them better. The second observation is that there's individual variation okay so if every single offspring were identical and each one had you know everything was identical between them you would imagine that all of them were survive or none of them would survive okay because they don't have any variation we know that that's not what happens when we look at offspring there's going to be variation in lots of different traits and some of that variation is going to be heritable so in this these two image, images, you can see some snails, they have different coloration, different patterns. That's going to be a source of variation and it may um, determine whether they survive or not, okay? Now, for example, when we ha kind of infer this overproduction of offspring and kind of variation, we infer that there's going to be a differential reproductive success, which means that some individuals are going to do really well, other ones are not going to do well. And so those individuals that have traits that are best suited for the local environment are going to leave larger, a larger share of offspring, okay? So in this diagram, what we see is that there's variation in the speed of these rabbits, okay? So you have a slow rabbit, you have kind of a moderately um, fast rabbit, and then you have a very fast rabbit, okay? Now, we're saying that this is a heritable trait, so the speed that you can run is inherited from your, your parents. When we put these two together, we can then have differential reproductive success. So if there is a predator like a fox, and we have the different um, rabbits, some of the rabbits are going to be really good at getting away from the fox, so the really fast ones, and kind of the moderately fast ones are going to also get away pretty well. But those slow ones are not going to survive very well. And so you're going to see that in the next generation, there's probably going to be a lot of this bluish green fast rabbits, and there's going to be few of the very slow rabbits. Okay, and so over time, you can see that the ones that do really well will start to be a bigger proportion of the population. So there are three more um, main points about evolution by natural selection. So these are some important things to remember. This one, this first one's a little difficult to understand, but individuals themselves do not evolve, okay? So in your lifetime, evolution does not take place, okay? It is the changes from generation to generation, and it's changes in the population. So kind of the smallest unit of evolution is going to be a population, which would be all of the organisms in an area that are of the same species. Okay, natural selection only acts on things that are heritable. So there are certain traits that are not heritable and therefore will not have natural selection act on them. Okay, only things that are, nat that are heritable can have natural selection. Okay, and then evolution is not goal-directed it does not lead to perfectly adapted organisms. Okay, there is no guiding hand for evolution. It is basically chance. Okay, if there's mutation that happens to confer 
higher reproductive, reproductive success, then that will lead to natural selection, okay? But there's not any goal that evolution is going towards. And so that, and I want to remind you of, you know, your knees and your spine, if we had a goal of, you know, a human adapting to be the perfect bipedal organism, we wouldn't have problems with our knees and our back, but we're not perfect, we're not perfect adaptations because history is gonna matter and there's not really a goal we're leading towards. All right, so when we look at evolution, we have to look at the population level. So when we look at the population, we say that they are going to share a gene pool. So when we talk about genes, think about alleles again. So what are the alleles that are present in a population? Okay, do we have alleles that make red flowers and we have alleles that make white flowers? Okay, we have examples of flowers here and these are um, different snakes. So different patterns of um, their bodies. These are going to be kind of the, the different alleles that are in the gene pool. When we look at allele frequency, so that's going to be kind of the abundance of a particular allele. So if we have, again, this red flower and white flower, and let's say that red is dominant to white, you know, how many red alleles do we have if it's going to be capital R? How many white alleles do we have, which would be little r? We can actually look at that allele frequency. And if that frequency changes over time, so let's just say that at some point white alleles disappear, we would say then that evolution has, has taken place because we're having changes in allele frequency in a population. So here are some different sources of variation and traits among individuals. So we're going to talk over, you know, some of these. A lot of these we've already talked about. So for example, mutations are going to be the ultimate source of variation. Okay, so they create new alleles, they're going to create new proteins, different things like that. Sometimes they're negative, other times they're silent or neutral, and other times they're going to be positive. Crossing over is going to be a, a big um, source of variation, independent assortment, fertilization, and then changes in chromosome number or structure. And so we haven't really talked about chromosome number changing, um, won't really discuss that much in this class, but that is a potential um, place where variation can take place. That mainly is going to happen in plants. Because in many animals, if you change the number of chromosomes, you're going to start having some major issues. So when we look at microevolution, and this is going to uh, kind of tell us if the allele frequency is changing over time, we have a, a um, kind of a equation or a principle called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, and this is going to allow us to see if a population is actually evolving or not. And so the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is basically saying that this is a non-evolving population. Okay, and so it's in genetic equilibrium, which means that alleles, allele frequencies are not changing. So you're not getting more red versus white flowers. They're going to stay exactly the same over time. Now, this is going to require a lot of assumptions and... Normally, these things are not going to uh, be true. So in order for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to take place, you cannot have any mutations. So no new alleles are generated. You have to have random mating, which means that there's no selective mating. And I'll explain kind of what that means. You'd have to have no gene flow. And so gene flow is going to be the basically, you know, moving... Um, from one population to another and having mating events. So if you have gene flow, that means that alleles can go from one population to another. In this case, we're saying there's no gene flow. So neither individuals nor their gametes enter or exit the population. So everything is gonna stay where it is. Um, for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you also have to have a very large population size, kind of infinitely large, which is not likely. And then you have to have no natural selection. So all alleles are going to confer equal fitness and make organisms equally likely to survive. Okay, and so this is kind of a funny cartoon about that. Now, what I'm going to say is that the reason why we set up this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is because we want to see what happens when it's not working. What happens when we are having evolution, because evolution is taking place. Okay, and so this idea of analyzing gene pools where you can use the Hardy-Weinberg formula 
and it can help you calculate kind of the frequencies of genotypes in a gene pool from the frequencies of alleles. Okay, and so um, here we have a kind of a population of pea plants. Um, you're going to notice that some of them have capital W, capital W, some of them are heterozygous with capital W, little w, and some of them are homozygous recessive with little w, little w. And so we're going to start to create this equation, and I'm never going to ask you how to do this. Like, I won't make you calculate this, but you will need to know the, understand the principles of the Hardy-Weinberg. Um, but the frequency of the dominant allele, so for example, the dominant allele in this case is going to be capital W. We are going to call that P. The frequency of the recessive allele is going to be Q. Um, and so if you have a heterozygote, you then have to say uh, it's going to be kind of PQ. Um, if you have a homozygous dominant, it's going to be P squared. Homozygous recessive, it's going to be Q squared. And if it is heterozygote, it's going to be 2PQ. Okay, that means that you have one of each of the different alleles. So here is the equation. It's um, P2, sorry, um, P squared by plus 2PQ plus Q2 equals 1. Okay, and so this probably sounds like a bunch of nonsense right now to you, but what this equation allows us to see is if there is a change in allele frequency. If there's a change in the allele frequency, then we have evolution taking place. Okay, so this is kind of the more important part. So here's our population of peas, and then we can look at kind of the frequency of the different genotypes. And so we know that we have um, kind of six of our genotypes are going to be big W, big W. We have one home, uh, heterozygote, big W, little w, and then two little w, little w's, okay? We can then see what the um, kind of phenotypic ratio is and ultimately kind of find out what our P and Q ratios are. So those are going to be our ratios of our different alleles. Now, if this is kind of the big, this is the important slide because I don't want, you really have to worry about calculating any of this. But in our original population generation, we had a frequency of capital W, that was 0.72 and lowercase w was 0.28. So that was the frequency of those alleles in that population. Over time, so if we have then look at the, the next generation, we can see that there is an additional white flower and there are now two of the heterozygotes. So the frequency of the alleles has changed. So the Capital W allele is now at 0.44, where it was originally at 7.2, and our little w is now at a 0.56, and it was originally at a 0.28. So what we see is that the allele frequency, so then you know which alleles are in the population, has changed, which means that the population is evolving. So this is what's happening kind of on the allelic level of evolution. Okay. So here's another example if we're looking at these little beetles. Um, and so you have kind of different, you have the capital A, capital A, which is kind of this gray beetle. Heterozygote is the gray as well, so it's a complete dominant situation. And then little a, little a is going to have a white um, little beetle. Okay, so you can find out what the frequencies of these are. Now, when we're doing the hydro binding equilibrium, we're assuming that certain, all those assumptions that we discussed previously were valid. But what happens is that's not really going to happen. And so these next slides are going to show how real life situations are going to kind of carry out. So mutations are something that happen quite often. And so if we have a mutation in a population, we can take a population that originally is all little a, little a. If there's a, a, a mutation that for some reason causes a capital A to be made, we can then have a new genotype. And so you'd have a different frequency of alleles in your final population, which means evolution is happening. And another example, we can have non-random mating. So non-random mating is more often than not the situation. So organisms don't tend to just mate with anything. They are going to mate with different individuals that have um, kind of a high fitness, we're not going to talk a lot about um, sexual selection today, but a little bit, but there usually is going to be something what we call 
either assortative mating where preference for similar phenotypes or genotypes or something called um, disortative mating, which there's a preference for different genotypes or phenotypes. But usually there's some type of non-random mating. So individuals do not mate randomly. Migration usually is something that's going to take place. So if we have two different populations and if there's no gene flow, then you would have kind of the separation. So you'd have 100% little a, little a on one side and 100% um, big A, big A on the other side. But if there is migration and gene flow, you can then move the alleles from one side to the other, which then can cause evolution to take place. And then we'll talk about this idea in a little bit more detail, but this idea of genetic drift, where sometimes there's random events where part different organisms, for some reason, all of them die out and only some of them get to mate, not because they're more fit, but because maybe they didn't get stepped on. And uh, only these little A, A1 survived, and so the next generation could be 100% of the little A um, allele purely by coincidence, okay? And so this is another example of how evolution can take place. And then we'll talk about natural selection where, you know, if there's some environmental change where a certain uh, phenotype is more hidden than another one, they're going to be less likely to be eaten and therefore they're going to have more offspring and are going to make up a large proportion of the generation, next generation. So again, the allele frequencies are changing over time. Okay. And so the mechanisms of evolution, the ones I kind of briefly just mentioned, the main ones are going to be mutation, genetic drift, gene flow, and natural selection. Okay. So this is how um, kind of the main evolutionary changes are going to happen. Now, Mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow don't always lead to adaptation. So adaptation is the idea that it's going to make an individual better adapted or better able to survive in its environment. Not all adaptations lead to something that's better. Okay, There are times where you're going to have genetic drift where things are kind of randomly um, change, not because of evolution. Natural selection, however, is always going to be kind of lead to adaptation or better um, survival for a sp specific type of environment. Okay, so of all the causes of microevolution, only natural selection promotes adaptation. All right, so here's a little more about genetic drift so I can just show you a little more detail. So genetic drift is going to be change in the gene pool of a very small population. Okay, and it's completely random, it's due to chance. So in this image, we have a generation one, which has mostly red flowers and one white flower. Okay, if we look at the allele frequency, we can see that you know, 0.7 of the alleles is gonna be our, the kind of red, and 0.3 is gonna be the white. If for some reason, in the next generation, maybe only the ones that are in the boxes had offspring, you can have a change in the allele frequency and so instead of having mostly red you now can have you know three white and again more of them are red but there's a different proportion of the alleles in this case and then let's just say that only two of the red flowers are going to have offspring for the next generation you can completely change what the population looks like and they could be all red okay this again is just has to do with chance this could be the fact that you have a group of people walk through an area and let's just say they really like white flowers and they pick all the white flowers so that they don't produce any seeds. That's genetic drift where it's completely chance um, and there's really no adaptation taking place. Now, an example of genetic drift is something called the bottleneck. And this is an example when there is some type of Kind of extreme reduction in the population size. It usually has to do with some type of dramatic uh, event like a hurricane or an earthquake or you know a pandemic coming through a population um, where it can actually really reduce the genetic variation in a population um, and only allow some of the original variation to persist into the future. And so we can see this bottle right here where you have the original population, you have 
purple balls, green balls, and orange balls. But because of this event, let's just say it was a wildflower, sorry, wildfire, only um, purple made it through and one green. And so the surviving population is going to have much less variation. We've completely lost the orange ball. Um, and that's all, again, it's kind of by chance. So only some things are going to be able to survive. Now, there are good examples of this. So the cheetahs um, that have been tracked, they think that there have been at least two genetic bottlenecks within the last 10,000 years. If you look at cheetahs, they are very closely related to each other. There's not a lot of variation in the genes. This is problematic because if there ever is some type of virus or bacterial infection that's really lethal to cheetahs, if every single cheetah is really kind of has the same genetic background and they're all susceptible to it, it could completely destroy the population of cheetahs. Um, in a normal kind of healthy population, there'd be lots of variation, but because of these bottlenecks, the variation is gone. And so it's kind of a more vulnerable um, species at this time. An example of this same idea in humans, kind of the bottleneck is called the founder effect. And, and this can also be, it doesn't have to be humans. It could just be um, any type of organism. But if you have kind of a few individuals colonize a very remote habitat and there isn't really any gene flow coming in, um, whatever is present in those individuals and their genes is what's gonna be what colonizes the island. And so an example of this is that there um, was a kind of a small group of individuals that moved to this island of half, it looks a little bit closer to Africa, but it's between Africa and South America. And um, these individuals, there are 15 of them, they founded a British colony, so they're from England originally. And um, they went to, they call it Tristan de Cunha. One of the colonists, so one of the 15, had this recessive allele for a, a progressive form of blindness called retinous pigmentosa. And because there's only 15 individuals on the island and there's one individual that has this recessive allele, this island has one of the highest levels of this um, disease proportionally because of the founders. Okay, because in a normal population, um, you have lots of variation, but because there's only 15 people on this island and one person carries it, that means that that is going to then increase the amount of this disease in this place. And this is an example of what it looks like if you have this um, progressive blindness. So you kind of have a tunnel vision sort of situation going on. The next kind of um, example is going to be gene flow. And so this is the idea that you can have two populations with different allele variants. So for example, in, in this image, we have kind of on the top, a red allele and we have a blue allele. If there is a genetic barrier, um, then the allele, the different group populations can't intermingle in kind of exchange alleles. But if there is a way to get from one side to the other and have gene flow, then you can have kind of a mixture and the alleles will be able to move back and forth um, and kind of increase that variation. So this is the genetic exchange um, within a population. Usually barriers are to gene flow are gonna be geographic. So if you have a mountain range between two populations of deer and there's no way to pass, then you're gonna have isolation of those two different groups. If however, there is then some pass that opens, you can then have gene flow that goes between. If you have gene flow, it tends to reduce the genetic differences between populations. We will talk about this in more detail when we talk about speciation, because um, the way that we can have speciation take place is through some type of barrier that prevents gene flow from happening. Okay, so all of those that we looked at, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutations were all, all of those kind of can lead to evolution, but not necessarily adaptive evolution where an organism is becoming better adapted to their environment. Okay, um, now when we talk about natural selection, we talk about Darwinian fitness, okay? And I've already talked a little bit about fitness with you before, but fitness is this idea that an individual is going to be able to contribute more 
kind of genetic material to the next generation. Okay, so having lots of offspring is going to increase your genetic fitness. Okay, and so if you are able to evade predators better or catch prey better, you are going to be more fit if you can then provide more food for your offspring and have more babies. Now, when we look at natural selection, there are three general outcomes, and uh, we call these directional selection, disruptive selection, and stabilizing selection. Okay, and so this is going to be kind of adaptations to an environment that allow these organisms to better survive. Okay, so if you have an original population, and in this case of mice, um, and they're going to be different colors. So you have white mice, but you have gradual kind of in between those kind of light gray, gray, darker gray, and maybe like a black mouse. Now, if you have that variation in the original population, you can then have evolution um, and have the phenotypes kind of change and which one is going to be the better um, phenotype than others. So in directional selection, you have a shift of the phenotypic curve. For, so for example, if these mice are now going to be found on kind of a dark substrate, so dark ground. The white and very light mice are not going to do very well because they're going to stick out really well and predators are going to be able to find them. And so they're going to likely get eaten, which means that their fitness is going to be zero because they're not going to be able to have any offspring. So what's going to happen is that it's going to select for the darker phenotype. So those that have darker fur are going to survive better, have more offspring, and that's going to mean that the population is going to tend to become darker in general. Okay, so that would be directional selection. And that could happen in the other way. So it could be that instead of the really dark ones, the white ones get are more adaptive and are able to hide better and therefore would survive. Another type is called disruptive selection, which means that kind of the the white and the very dark mice, both of those do really well in a specific type of environment, but the ones in the middle somehow are not doing as well. And so you start to get kind of this disruptive, which means that you have a splitting of these two phenotypes. And ultimately this can lead to speciation if there is enough separation between the two groups, um, but it also can just kind of keep them in between. So this is saying that there's a lot of white and a lot of um, black mice but the ones in the middle, for some reason, they're either easier to see or don't do as well. And so they're not going to kind of be the selected group. The last type is called stabilizing selection, where for some reason, the intermediate kind of this middle phenotype is going to be the best or the most common. Um, and so for that environment, it's going to be the one that is going to survive the best, have the most offspring. And therefore, that is going to be the, the color the mice are going to be um, the most. Okay. Now, there's a different type of selection that's not natural selection, um, but it can increase fitness. And this is called sexual selection. So if you look at organisms, specifically animals, there's a lot of what we call sexual dimorphism. And dimorphism means kind of two morphs or two forms. Males and females often look very different from each other. So for example, um, in the, the three species groups I'm talking about here, we have finches, we have um, kind of these rams, and then we have the peacock. And so in the finch and the peacock, the males are the very brightly colored of the, of the two. Females tend to be more drab. And that's because the males are displaying kind of their fitness and their health um, with these kind of costly displays. Um, for the male rams, the females don't have horns like this and they also don't compete in kind of these combats because the males are fighting over for the females um, kind of showing that they are good males and the females will select them. Okay, so the kind of the sexual dimorphism is not directly associated with reproduction or survival, but it can increase your fitness if you are selected um, by a mate. Okay, so if the female selects the ram that wins this competition, has bigger horns, then that male is going to be very fit because he's going to have a lot of offspring. Okay, 
so sexual selection is really interesting. Um, it's not something that we get to go into a lot of detail about, but it does explain kind of why different organisms have such dramatic differences between the males and the females.